Welcome to Kingdom Talks, where we are exploring new dimensions of the Kingdom Restoration Age. Why are tens of millions of Christians seeking God beyond the traditional church? Is the church age over? Is the Father really in the process of restoring all things, as Peter said? If so, what does this look like? What's next on our Father's agenda? What amazing and revolutionary things does our Heavenly Father have for us right now on earth? Does God truly love everyone? Can we truly be one with Jesus and the Father as Jesus prayed for us to be? Maturing sons and daughters of God all over the world are waking up to their true power and potential in Christ. Are you one of them? What did Jesus mean when he said that his followers would do even greater works than he did? What are these greater works? What would true kingdom culture look like on earth? Kingdom business? Kingdom government? Kingdom education? Join in the conversation with your host, Gil Hodges, as we explore these amazing mysteries of the kingdom and their applications for kingdom communities all around the world. Hey, everyone. Good evening and welcome to Kingdom Talks. Gil is still out this week. This will be my uh, final week in this little stretch here of guest hosting the show. Uh, my name is Michael King. We are... Um, having trouble streaming this to Facebook and I'm not really sure why. So um, we'll see how that goes and work on getting that fixed later. But uh, I'm going to bring on our guest tonight. I'm really excited to have her. Her name is Dr. Robin Perry Braun. She is the author of the book Living as a Son. She does amazing inner healing deliverance work, nutritional work. She does a lot of really cool stuff. I've worked with her myself and I would highly recommend her to anyone. We'll bring her on in a second and let her tell you a little more about uh, her book, about what she does, about how you can benefit from that, and really what the process looks like, um, how we step into living life as a son. So let's bring her on. Hey, Dr. Robin, how are you doing? Hey, Michael, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, uh, for people don't know, my youngest child went, is a sophomore in college, and so because most of my work has ended up going virtual and I am a beach girl, I have decided to travel this year. So I'm essentially homeless and I am traveling. And it's been amazing because, you know, normally I, I try to practice what I preach and I and I teach on living at a high vibration at a high frequency and, and peace and joy. And so that has to do with rest and really good work life balance and taking good care of yourself. And so I would I would travel every eight to twelve weeks and take a week off anyway. Um, but what I realized with friends, where I don't have a week and then I have to go home, I really have become much more in living in the moment or in the present. I mean, I I'm very sensitive to like living from my heart and really being with people I have heart connections with, but it's kind of like I have made this commitment to not plan my life too far out where I'm going next and how far out and buy my tickets too far out and all that. And I've just really become aware of being more present. I'm, I'm very much a little bit of a workaholic and I've always got a hundred projects going on in my head and I'm always, I'm, time is not my love language. So I'm always thinking, what is the next thing I need to do? And so it's been really sweet. I've had just a really, really sweet time so far, really connecting to some um, people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so anybody who's thinking about doing this of just taking like some time off, if you can work virtually. And uh, it's it's been really uh, precious, a lot of emotional things going through with empty nester and all that kind of stuff too, but some very cool surprises and revelations and uh somewhat reinventing myself again, you know, as we do frequently. So yeah, well, that's super awesome. And I mean, I love that you've got the flexibility to do that as well as um, I don't know, just the wonder that I think it brings to be able to travel and just see different places. And, and, you know, sometimes I think it's good to intentionally switch things up. I've um, in the last few years in my life intentionally started 
like just doing things differently than I would normally do. Like, for example, like my watch is red. I normally am like a black and blue just because that's what I've always done. And and one time I just was at the store and like at the last second when they're like grabbing it out of the case, I mean, it's like a $20 Walmart watch. It's not expensive, but <laughs> I was like, let's grab that one to the left that's red just because I was like forcing myself to step out of my comfort zone and do something different. It's good. Um, yeah. And it just, it, it helps you even rewire your brain and like makes you uncomfortable, but like uncomfortable in non-harmful ways, if that makes sense. And it challenges Agreed. you. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Anyway, so I, um, I, because I'm a quantum, I have a, a doctorate in energy medicine. So because I really grasp not at an MIT level, but I grasp the principles of quantum energy and that, you know, our, we're made up of frequencies and vibrations and our thoughts matter and our environment matters and everything matters. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm very intentional about, and I've grown more so, you know, my first book was really about, not my first book, but the book before this book was about living at peace and joy. Actually, my first book was about that. And I guess what I've seen, you know, the kingdom of heaven is is righteousness, peace and joy. And so every day or every week I grow and I become more mindful of every little thing that takes our energy, that steals our energy, that moves us away from peace and joy. And, and everything has the cost, you know, is it is it worth making that comment on that Facebook post? Like, is it worth what that's going to take from you, right? Is it going to give you something back that's beneficial or positive? So, you know, I think just becoming even more acutely aware of that. Um, hold on just a sec. Well, while she's doing that, I'm going to just encourage you all, if you're watching and listening, please click the like button, the share button, uh, ask your questions, you know, share your comments in the chat. Uh, in a second here, I'm going to throw on some links uh, to uh, websites. So if somebody wants to connect with you more, Robin, uh, see more of what you do, they'll be able to find those in the comments as well. Sorry, I just realized my computer was unplugged and my battery was telling me it was, I was like, oh no. <laughs> so, and, and then I had to go find the plug. Um, Anyway, so I, I just, um, you know, this journey I've been on for a really long time. I mean, the Lord is just really from the time I got saved and went to a treatment center for an eating disorder. It's like my whole path has been directed towards what I do and towards w what I believe and what I speak. And there's no accidents. I mean, I'm, you know, I've stumbled to so many things accidentally and I went, oh, that was the Lord, you know. <laughs> And, and, and many of them were things nobody else was doing, or there were very few people. And so, you know, I'm really blessed to get to have this life. It's really amazing to get to travel, get to spend time with people I care about, um, get to teach, get to, to work one-on-one -on -one with people. I, I get to train the, the modality that I created. I have, a tra I have a training program and I've trained over a hundred people in it. And these are now my tribe. I mean, I always say, Hey, I got spirit filled. I was in the prophetic movement. And so that was a small percentage of the population. And then as time went on, I was into alternative medicine. It got smaller. And then I went into quantum energy and that even got smaller. And then I work with survivors of ritual abuse. And so like I'm in the 0.000% of the population. And I have a whole tribe of people just like me. So it's amazing to not have to always be looking for place, places and ways to connect, but to kind of have created accidentally my own group of people that we just get each other and we, yeah. we believe so much of the same way. And yet we can still challenge each other and things as well. So, yeah, that is so fantastic. Well, um, you know, having, you know, like I said, I've, I've done some work with you firsthand. Like I have to say, I'm a really, I'm a fan of the work you do as well as the, the tool you have created, because I think it really, it really helps accelerate this process of inner healing and just personal growth and transformation that, um, that we go on. Like if you look all throughout scripture, like it's talking about how we become transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus. You know, it talks right. in Romans 12 too about being transfigured by renewing our minds. There's all these different passages that talk about how we go through this, this growth process, this transformation process. 
not that Jesus didn't finish it all, but at the same time, there's still this, this ongoing movement or growth or transformation that we undergo to apprehend what he, what he purchased. Right. right. And, and I just love how some of what you're doing, I think is accelerating that for people. Whereas 20 years ago, something used to take 20 years and right. some of what you're doing, I think you shorten that significantly for people. Yeah. And that's one of the things we found is when you look at the body, soul, and spirit as one, is I always say it's like a, a messy cherry pie. They forgot to put the cornstarch in and try to cut it in three pieces and it's just running all over the place. And that really is how we are. Most physical things are not caused by physical causes. Yeah. Most pain is emotional. It can be spiritual. And so what I find is that if we can look at these layers of things as they come up, um, we're going to have greater progress. And so all trauma has spiritual elements, physical elements, and it's complicated and everybody's different. There's no formulas that just work for the same people. So having a toolbox that is that d differential with every single person and yet can be taught how to use pretty easily, you know, really has been um, extremely rewarding to be able to put that together and then see all these people other using it successfully on themselves, on their family, on other people. You know, for me, it kind of doesn't get better than that. You know, if, when I lay my head on the pillow, I think, wow, I may not have reached a million people, but the people that I've been able to impact or affect are, are changing lives, too, and have stories. So um, it, it is very rewarding. And, um, you know, talking about my new book, Living Like a Son, I have a chapter in that in my previous book, Thrive. But as I've worked with clients for all these years, you know, I see over and over and over and over again, the two things that seem to be rooted in all of their self-hatred, all of their low self-esteem, all of their sicknesses, all their illnesses. Well, and they're connected. One is performance-based identity, that they're only lovable if they're excellent, if they're perfect, if they don't make mistakes, if they do really well. And the world supports that. The world reinforces this performance-based identity, right? Yeah. But it's completely counter to what God says. You know, unconditional love is not based on what you do. Jesus did it all. We don't have to do anything. And then secondarily, parallel to that is fear-based relationship with God. If we see God as a punishing, mean God who's going to punish us because we're not perfect, then we can't have peace, joy, and feel safe and secure in that relationship um, because it could be, it, it, he, he could get mad at any given moment and mess us up, you know? Yeah, it's true. Well, like I used to that, you're perfectly describing what I grew up learning. So my dad's an Episcopal right. priest and it wasn't necessarily what was meant to be taught to me, but it's definitely what I learned as a kid um, it's, you know, very liturgical, highly ritualistic in the sense of like, that there's a lot of like ceremony. Right. Yeah. Um, but I always learned Jesus was always my best friend, but the father was always angry. Like that was, that was the message that I internalized. And, and so I was always basically like, you have this Zeus like image of the father who's getting ready to smite you with the lightning bolt, and right. he's got, he's like your best friend which creates this weird dichotomy when Jesus says, like, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. It's like, right. well, no, Jesus is kind, but I don't right. get the father. Like it creates this weird, like disconnect where you're trying to understand who this father is because, and so you don't know how to live like a son because right. you're afraid of the father, right. but you know, Jesus is okay. So like he's worked it out, but it took me a process of really learning that when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, it's because he's the father of heavenly lights in whom there is no twisting and turning of shadows. There's no darkness. You know, like if you've seen what Jesus is like, it's because these express image of the invisible God, like the things that the Bible says about who Jesus is, you know, the same as the father. Like when we see this, this Jesus walking around who heals right. all the sick and loves everyone unconditionally, all this stuff, that's what the father's like. Right. But we've taken this like pagan image of this angry judgmental God and superimpose that over who the father is. Yeah. And that's really what my book is about. You know, I, I don't profess to have perfect theology, um, but I've known the presence of the father for more than 30, 35 years almost or 35 years. And and he's never changed. And so it didn't matter what I learned or didn't learn. His presence never changed to me. And so always trying to fit what I was being taught from the pulpit into how does this 
seems to contradict. And so there's got to be another explanation. Two things cannot contradict. Yeah. And so there has to be another explanation. And over the years, and I talk about this in my book, you know, you have scriptures that are taught because people don't necessarily, uh, or, you know, people go to seminary or, or they, they study, they don't know context or they're repeating what was taught to them <clears throat> um, or they have performance-based identity. You know, our father, our natural father, was mean, you know, all these things we subconsciously hold and believe. And then we project, we preach. And so I kind of set my book up as, hey, I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. But here's that I know that I know that I know as a plumb line, God is love. Yeah. God is love. And and love, perfect love casts out all fear. So I know I can't be afraid in God's presence. That word awe is not fear is mistranslated awe in a lot of places. The fear of God is actually a mistranslated for the word awe. So there's a lot of explanations when you dig down. And I, and I've, um, I like Richard Murray. Uh, Gil's actually had him on the show before. He's got some great theology, this other yeah, guy, great. Randy Elstrad. And a lot of these people are, um, you know, they are not they say very heretical stuff, but they give scripture to back it up that you go, how have I not seen that before? It's the lens you're looking through. And so I try to give a little bit of this and that in the book to try to at least present this idea of what if that's not what it meant? Like yeah. not saying I know the answer, but what early, early on in my walk, I remember clearly and I was kind of coming out of some more Baptisty type of background and I got spirit filled, but I was wanting to really grasp my own theology. I think one thing that's been great that God allowed for me is I never followed a single man. I was always multiple looking at very different theologies, different people. I didn't have a, you know, I never put one man on a pedestal that I just cookie cutter took their theology as gospel. Yeah. And I remember reading a book one time on once saved, always saved. And then I turned around and read another book on how you could lose your salvation. They were both famous theologians. They both used scripture. And I just ended up confused. And I felt like what the Lord showed me. And he said, Robin, it's very difficult to live with ambiguity. And some people just can't do it. He said, but if there was one right, perfect translation of scripture, we would worship the book instead of letting the book be the pathway or the guide to the father, to the creator, to the relationship. It's easy to read and memorize. It's harder to relate on a personal level. And, and that really stuck with me. And so I became okay with the ambiguity, not understanding the everything. And sometimes, and I would ask him, God, this just doesn't feel right. It doesn't sense right. You know, um, I will hold this loosely until you give me a better answer. And that seems to have been a lot of my journey is I just held things loosely. If they didn't quite fit, they didn't seem to quite resonate or there were contradictions in some way. And, uh, and again, I don't have all the answers because I'm sure I'm wrong in so many places, but I have a lot of questions. But what I know that I know that I know is who he is and what I know in my area of expertise is how human soul is created, how humans are wired. And I know that that God that you cannot be healthy, happy, peaceful, joyful, serving that God. That is a slavery mindset. And you can't be both. Yeah. And so I know that there's something missing where we have to learn where have we believed wrongly about Father. I, I think one of the other things, and, and you and I know because we both are connected to this world of SRA, is that um, Lucifer is not a good father. He is punishing all of the pagan gods in the Old Testament. They were mean. They were punishing. They destroyed. They demanded absolute perfection and, and, and service. And they were incapable of love. Yeah. So we one of my passions in writing this book is, you know, God didn't need me to defend him. But it hurts my heart that people don't know who he is. Yeah. And they're so wounded and they blame him for stuff that goes wrong. And I'm like, you know, it's it, it, you got the wrong lens. You're seeing these things through because of bad theology or just you're internalizing your father's, you know, 
pain and your father's punish uh, abuse and you don't know that and that's a lot of what i do what i do is reprogramming the subconscious and father wounds get subconsciously projected onto father god whether we realize it or not we can say we believe this but our beliefs are in our subconscious and yeah. that's where they're going to, and they're, and our subconscious is more powerful than our conscious mind. And ultimately that's what we're going to see. And I do believe that's one of the reasons bad theology gets done is it's the lens through which we're studying and reading. And, and they, some of these theologians just don't know him. Yeah. So, well, I mean, sometimes too, the thing about translation that a lot of times people I think don't understand, and I've written about this in some of my books, is that that translation of languages, like for anyone who only speaks one language, it just doesn't make as much sense. When you speak multiple languages, you realize translation is an art. It's not a science. Like, because, um, for example, it, I was talking to somebody about this last week, actually, in Japanese, the, the, the syntax or structure of a sentence is very different than in English or in Spanish. Like... Um, um, like in, in Japanese, you, you identify like the location and the ownership before you identify what the item is. Okay. So you have to like listen to the whole sentence before you entirely know what you're talking about. Whereas in English, you're going to talk about the object or the item before you're going to identify that you own it or whatever. Like mm -hmm. there's just this difference in the structure of, um, of the way the sentence is. And so um, if you're trying to translate something from one language to another, you have to communicate these ideas and thoughts and meanings and whatever right. that that it doesn't always have like a literal one to one word for it. Um, mm -hmm. Like even in English versus uh, Greek that has multiple words for the term love, we've got one word for it, which is love. So right. you have to then use other words or like adjectives to kind of communicate what type of love you're talking about, because right. you can't just use that one word as a standalone item to be like a one to one you know, a one-to-one -one for that Greek word. And Hebrew is similar in that regard. You can't always just give a one-to-one -one, uh, word translation. So you have to communicate these concepts. And depending on what you believe that word is communicating, it's going to identify or shift how you communicate that concept when you take it from this language to that one. Because you're going to yeah. read a different shade of meaning when you pick what English word to translate it as. Right, right. And, and I think that that's, uh, you know, one of the quotes I have in my book, which just happened to happen around the time I was writing it was, um, you know, Rick Warren, after 40 years of preaching that women shouldn't be in ministry, recanted. Yeah. And he said, here's what he said. He said, in Bible school, I think he went to a Baptist Bible school, that they would not let me read certain commentaries. I was not allowed to read those. And over COVID, he just decided to go pick up some other commentaries and he changed his position. Yeah. And so imagine all these women for years and years that were told God, you, you know, and it doesn't matter that Paul said in Christ there is no male and female, you know, or the, the exegesis of current or contextual versus universal meanings, all those things. He believed his teachers, they're taught to do this in exegesis, yeah. but his commentaries were his his Bible. Yeah. And he was not allowed to study anything outside of what was given to him. That's mind control and programming. Yeah. We do that in medicine too. I mean, to be honest, sure. it's the same way. Like it's yeah. that way in medicine. It's that way in lots of different fields. You and know, yeah. Different I mean, critical thinking is taking multiple sources and context and deciding what you believe from reading opposing opinions and yeah. coming to your conclusion. And they weren't allowed to do that in his seminary. So it's just interesting that he's coming forth and repenting and confessing. Yeah. But there's a lot of bad fruit that came out of that dogmatic theology and continues to. Yeah. And, and then, so, you know, anyway, how many, how many times has God provided the solution of the wisdom or whatever needed, you know, with this example, you know, with women in ministry, right? How many times has God provided a solution or an answer or whatever? And that solution has been provided in the form of a person that we think is not allowed to minister. Right. So we don't let right. them. So, right. We're like, Lord, we've been asking for you to provide the solution. He's like, I provided it in like eight different people. You just don't want any of them. Your religion won't let you see it. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway. You've got a box of limitations. And so, you know, one so of the things I, I do love about your book, because I have read it, is, yeah. is that I think one of the things your book does is it starts to help people to take that lid off of the way that we've self-limited our identity, the way we've self-limited what we think we're allowed to believe. Like, yeah. I think it really does a good job of helping people 
expand in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah. And again, just, you know, as my own journey of getting down to my subconscious beliefs and wounds and hurts, because I practice what I preach yeah. in realizing that even though I had a really good dad, there were still things about my dad that I projected onto God and that he, you know, had to overcome. Um, one was which, you know, my dad was an engineer. And so he was not a very emotional person or knew how to validate my emotions. Yeah. So again, that was something I had to experientially feel differently about God with. And, and he did some really cool things over the years to reprogram that belief. Um, but most people, they get saved and they just think, OK, they're taught by whatever denomination. Put all that behind you. They're carrying all these wounds. And if you understand quantum principle, we are never actually living in the present. Our present is completely comprised of everything we carry yeah. that we have been programmed or chosen to believe. And that um, scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That word heart is actually translated subconscious in Hebrew. As you think, and that word means believe, as you believe in your subconscious, so are you. So as you believe about your father, you carry that. As you believe about your mother, I mean, statistically, most people marry their mother or their father because yeah. we're, there's lots of reasons behind that. I won't go into all of them, but there's <laughs> a quantum reason, a spiritual reason, a psychological reason. I can describe it in all three. Even like a, The quantum one's more like, not more, but partly even to do with entanglement of genetics, like... Well, that too, well, we just, if I believe men are this, I'm going to attract that kind of man. The yeah. spiritual would be the law of bitter root judgments, Matthew 7, 1, whoever I've judged would be judged back on me. And so I would continue that cycle. In psychology, we call it unfinished business. Whoever I have, you know, bitterness um, about, I will um, continue to try to fix that problem with the next person because I couldn't fix it with the first. So I will keep finding people like that person I couldn't fix and try to fix it. And so that's the principle of unfinished business. But they're all the same principle. They all do the same thing. And so it, statistically yeah. speaking, you can't lie against the statistics. We, those of us who are counselors or inner healers, we do this every day. There's pretty consistent patterns. And so if we can go back and get healing for that, it's not just about God. It's about all relationships. We will yeah. keep repeating the same things over and over again, unless we know how to go back and get to those root causes. Jesus healed. And I love Katie Souza's teaching on this, which I won't go into great detail, but she showed in the, in the Aramaic that the way Jesus healed was he went back through space and time to the origin of the root cause of whatever their issue was. And he pulled it out by the root. And that's what we do when we do, you know, inner healing is we go back to the origin of the root and we pull out the pain, we reprogram the belief, whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, and then the it immediately shifts the outcome uh, quantumly and emotionally and experientially. And the thing that's cool about this is um, not only does it shift it for you, it shifts it for everyone else who's been entangled with that issue with you, with whatever. Yes. So like there, there are times where people will get inner healing um, for something that they're dealing with in their family situation, something personally, and it will start to have a ripple effect to other relatives. They may even have like a relative contact them that, you know, mm -hmm. they did some forgiveness or inner healing related to, because even if they weren't consciously aware of it, they, um, you know, they felt that something shifted in their relationship with that person because they either disentangled or changed the way that they were entangled. They resolved underlying issues like we can actually just by, you know, me getting free of something in my own heart. It can actually help set hundreds of other people around the world free. I mean, possibly more thousands and tens of thousands. But, you know, right. it can set at minimum hundreds of people three free just because of the way things go through generations and generational iniquity and right. that kind of stuff. Right. Right. And that's a big deal. And that's in there, too. I mean, I think that um, one of the things that's not taught in the charismatic church is about cleaning up your family line, closing generational doors. I mean, Freemasonry has pretty much decimated our country because the O's and vows they take are then being being handed down to the success as generation. We are in their DNA. John Sanford taught on this. He's the father of inner healing in, in the 80s is that 
the generational iniquity is handed down until we learn how to negate, renounce, cancel the contracts that were made through the oaths and vows um, or apply the blood of Jesus to whatever that is. Jesus gave us everything we need to do it, but it's not an automatic fix. We have to yeah. appropriate it. And people will go, well, you know, my, you know, when I got saved, all my generational stuff went away. And I said, well, how's that working for you? Because yeah. <laughs> in the body of Christ, I see as much incest and sexual abuse and porn addiction and depression, anxiety and alcoholism is in the world. So yeah. I think there's still something missing than just this formula, theological formula that you think it just went away. Um, so anyway, I, you know, that's such an important component is, is to also is the stuff that gets handed down. And they've done ton, even in the secular world, they've done a ton of study on trauma being physically handed down in the DNA to the next generations who will have memories from their ancestors of unresolved trauma. And it impacts them too. Well, even up and down regulates which, um, you know, genes get expression, you know, just right. from a scientific perspective, like you can have the same gene, but it, it, it like regulates or flips on or off is the easy way to think of it, like a light switch. Um, I mean, it doesn't work that way chemically, but it's that kind of concept um, that it regulates what does and doesn't get physical expression in the way your body produces proteins and chemicals uh -huh. and all of these different things. Um, so it has a physical impact on your body. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hey, Robin, we're going to take a break real quick, but when we come back, I would love it if um, we can dive more into this topic of kind of why inner healing matters. Um, we'd even talked a little bit before about possibly diving into, you know, some of these like big ticket names of, you know, people in the church that, um, you know, that are having, why all this stuff matters, you know, for leadership, for getting healing in the generational lines and the impact that can have. So we'll uh, take a quick Sounds break. Good. And, um, encourage everybody who is on right now, give a like, give a share and uh, help spread the word. And we'll be right back. Hey there. Thank you for joining Kingdom Talks. We are taking a short break to share with you the life-changing online course called Ultimate Impact. Gil and Adina do an amazing job taking the complicated and making it simple and applicable for your life. Ecclesia groups are using this course to shift their thinking into the next age paradigm. Yeshua spoke of power, authority, love, and oneness that we have yet to walk in. So if you're ready to deconstruct limiting beliefs in order to step into what Father is doing now, this course is for you. Sign up today at KingdomTalksMedia.com under the Courses tab. Now, back to the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I have with me Dr. Robin Perry Braun. We've been talking, I'm going to throw this in a chat, about her book, Living Like a Son, and uh, just some of the inner healing and, and really in, internal freedom and transformation work that she does with people. Um, Robin, thanks again for joining us. I wanted to uh, kind of dive into the second half of this session. I wanted us to talk a little bit about, um, you know, before you were talking about how, how generational iniquity influences people and how if we really look at the church, right, are we really doing any better than anyone else in the world is? You know, um, I've talked to people who are like, yeah, I'm free, I'm good, I'm saved. And I'm like, but do you have anxiety? Do you have fear? Do you have all of the issues that plague everybody else in the world? And it's not right. that Jesus didn't save or doesn't save, but that there's a lot of growth and transformation still to occur. And um, you mentioned, you know, while we were uh, talking before the show, uh, something about s some of the way this impacts leadership. Can you talk yeah. a little bit more about that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, for a long time, I've been teaching that we're, we've got it backwards, that really after we get saved um, and I'm far from the Lord, the next thing we should do is really go after that deep inner healing because what, what happens is that, you know, the, the, especially the charismatic church will tend to value gifting over character or character looks good on the outside, but people are hiding all their deep problems. We used to joke that, um, that the, sorry for the word, but it's the best word to use. The two most screwed up people in the world are ministers and psychologists because they went to school to try to fix themselves. Yeah. And so education is never going to fix all that brokenness inside. It really needs healing. And we also yeah. you typically have to let other people in. We can't just fix ourselves. And God, you know, made us to be relational. So he's not going to just supernaturally fix it. And so then these people get saved and they have some kind of gifting. 
some of which may have come from the occult in their ancestor line. And so they've already got a mixture of spiritual gifts that didn't all come from the Lord. And they don't know it. I'm not saying they know they're walking. Yeah, it's not a judgment. Path. It's just a fact that that's where sometimes it's it just came a fact. From. Yeah. Yeah. And so then they get, oh, my gosh, this prophet is so accurate or he's got a healing anointing. We're going to throw him up on stage and make him famous and give him a church. And thousands of people are going to fall at his feet and go, you're so awesome. Well, one, men don't make good God. So the ego usually can't <laughs> so handle true. that. Two, most of them are just they need their own healing. And now they're in a position in a fishbowl under a spotlight and their income depends on this gift. Yeah. And so they get stuck and they're struggling inside. And the yeah, enemy how can is you be vulnerable when everybody's staring at you, judging your every move. You've got all these critics. The moment you say, hey, I've got this issue I'm struggling with. You're not allowed to be human anymore. You no, have to and the judgment or you have to step down. And that's fair. You should step down if you're struggling in a certain area. But now what about your family and your income and your, yeah. you know, it's not designed very well. And then we go back to the legal ground thing. If you've got all these open doors because of your own past or things in your generational line, if we understand courts of heaven, the enemy has permission to test you, to afflict you in those areas. Yeah. And he's going to come after you hard because you're impacting a lot of people. And if he can take you down, he can take down those people. And you and I know the church is infiltrated anyway, yeah. but the rest of the people it's just this is happening over and over again. You know, this is why PKs, preacher's kids, are so disillusioned with the church is because the dad and mom they have at home are not the dad and mom they, that you see at church. Yeah. Because they don't practice what they preach. They don't live authentically and get that healing first and then let their life be a display of that. But the church is designed that way. It's a system. It's that Babylonian hierarchy of the ziggurat system. Um, the yeah. Tower of Babel, it was a spiral that was trying to go up to the heavens and the caste system and the hierarchy system. This person's above this person's of this person. It's not the way Jesus designed it and it doesn't work. And so if we could make inner healing a bigger priority to be that be like the most important thing you do rather than just memorizing scripture, then we would have a more holistic healed people. We would walk down the street if the kingdom of heaven, the frequency of the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace and joy. When we walk in the the door, we should impact the room with just our vibration. Yeah. We should sure. just be carriers of peace. You, you what we understand about quantum, your intention and your intention doesn't lie. Your frequency doesn't lie. Your words can lie all day long. Yeah. But who you are is broadcasted the minute you walk in a room. It's just we're so dulled down between fluoride and glyphosate in our pineal gland. We're not picking up on all the signals. And so we we, we lack discernment. Um, but and that's intentional, too. But yeah. so if we could shift the system and just make it a priority, I will say this. The, my kids in this generation are much more likely to go to counseling than my generation was. And it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Right. So because they see how screwed up we are. They're like, hey, I'm going to counseling as quick as I can because I don't want to end up like them. You know, for sure. So, and I think it's become a little bit more of a cultural norm in a healthy way that that not only is it normal to deal with mental health, but it's OK. And it's it's a good thing. Like so I, I think that's something we can really applaud. Like I think in every every area, God is pushing forward this idea of becoming more whole and healthy. Um, you know, in the church, you know, God's accelerating our, our methodologies in psychology. We're gaining, you know, certain different and better understandings about the human mind and the soul. Uh, you know, like you said, it's becoming more of a cool thing to go to therapy. Not that it's like about being cool, but it's about it makes a difference and you get healthier and you get more whole and you have a more functional life. You don't have the subconscious messages that help you make terrible decisions are now changing. So it helps you make good decisions, you know, right. Um so, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really a uh, it's a really good thing. Yeah, I always say when people say, well, I just want to be normal. I'm like, no, you don't actually normal in the U.S. is not good. Yeah, that, is not, is, that is not a normal goal statistically is not a good thing. We want to be like anti normal <laughs> and find out what, what how did God design us to be? Let's go after that, because I don't see that many people, unfortunately, 
And I do believe one of the main roots is that the effects generationally of Freemasonry, because it's so pervasive yeah. in our country. And then you get more and more dysfunction to the next generation, the next generation, more alcoholism, more addiction, more depression, more anxiety, more sexual abuse. The pervasiveness of molestation and sexual abuse is horrific. If people had any idea, I mean, it's horrific. And, and the, the percentage of men who struggle with pornography is high. And yeah. so we have to start and the with the technology you know, made it more accessible too. I oh, mean, the tech, oh, the ridiculous. Like these poor, you know, you don't have to run down to the store or buy a magazine anymore. You just have to like flip open your phone. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not our friend in that area, but um, so we've got to come up with better answers because we are crumbling. And so this advancement of quantum energy medicine and just understanding, I mean, the toxicity level, it gets worse and worse and worse in our country. 5G is horrible on the body, soul and spirit. And so we can remedy these things. There's a remedy for everything. We just have to educate and know what it is, but it is harder to stay healthy than it was in my parents' generation. It's very hard. You have to actually work at it. You can't just take it for granted. Yeah. But I think the positive, and, and, and in what you're saying, it's so true. It's all fixable. Um, yeah. You know, so anyone, and I say that only because anybody hearing this, like, oh my God, like it can be really easy when we focus on the negative to be weighed down right. and burdened by, oh my gosh, just all these things to overcome. Well, yeah, there are. But, but that's also, again, where focusing on love, peace, and joy. Like if I choose to focus on the fact that there are solutions for these things, yes. if I choose to recognize that when I come in agreement with God's plans for me, I start to shift my mindsets and my beliefs and come out of alignment with darkness and into alignment with this goodness in life, right? As I engage these things, it actually starts to shift what energies do and don't even come into my body. Like, right. so, so it's not that you don't have to put effort or energy into it. It's that... There's a there's like a snowballing effect of his goodness and grace that actually carries you forward the healthier you get. Right. Yeah. And I think and that's really my goal. The law of expansion says whatever we focus on, we give power to and it gets bigger. So yeah. we want to focus on the, the power we contain to actually change the world. Yeah. And if we know that we're that powerful, if we're working towards reprogramming our beliefs, aligning with peace and joy shifting or changing who we are, we become world changers just by being in alignment with what God designed us to be. And that's what yeah. sons are. They're moving towards alignment with who God designed them to be. And as you know, the scripture, it says the whole earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of sons. I believe this is the season we're in. Yeah. We desperately need to see what sonship looks like because everything that the church has been doing, not everything, we're losing. We, we've we've been losing. We yeah. haven't been winning. We haven't been gaining ground. I believe in the season because of some of the victories, though, in the spirit realm. That's why we're seeing all these ministers fall, because light exposes darkness. And so as the light shines on it, you know, I hop that stuff's been going on 30 years and it's just now really being outed. So. Uh, or more. And so yeah. and this is one example, like what like, T.D. Jakes is the new one that came out this last week, that there's all kinds of weirdness going on there. And I don't even know all the details to know what else, but I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot more going on there and that's going to yeah. come out too. So the question is who else and what else? Well, and you know, in our industry, we, we know some of those names we, we can't share, but um, it, it's time for it to come out and it's going to disillusion the average person but if they understand that men are prone to fall, that, that, that they're just men, they put their pants on yeah. the same way and just be the anointing. You can have the anointing and be flawed and have a lot of character issues and iniquity and still God show up and still use you to do stuff. Yeah. And so we have to look at changing this paradigm. And I do believe that's the stage we're in of, you know, sons don't lead mega churches. That's not what they look like. It's a level playing field. And we have to stop adulating people as gods because that's idolatry. And that happens every day. I think the way you put it earlier, men take make terrible gods. Like it's a yeah. really good way of putting it because I think sometimes like we, we come across a truth or a revelation and it, and it is so life impacting and heart impacting to us that we start to then put the person God gave that insight to on a pedestal. Now, 
don't get yeah. me wrong. Like we want to love, honor, and respect people and value what God did in and through them. So it's not that we shouldn't value that, right? And value that person and the impact they've had. But there's a difference between honoring somebody and then letting that like tip over into some level of worship. You know what I mean? Right. And I think yeah, that's I, some I of what God's helping, helping bring us out of this place of worshiping other people. Because right. once we realize that people are people, right, I can value the things, the truths that you're bringing, the things that God is giving you wisdom and insight on, and I can value you, honor you, love you, and all of that. And yet simultaneously, your successes or failures, neither of those things have to positively or negatively impact me outside of, um, you know, like, I can celebrate your successes and I can mourn your failures. Like, like, but it doesn't have to deeply impact who I am, you know, because if we think about it, like if as a son, I'm comfortable and confident in who I am. And, and, and when I say son, this is non-gendered, right? It's not right. Male, right. males do it's this position. only. It's talking yeah. a position of, yeah, where we are in relation to our father in heaven. Father. Um, okay. It's not your good opinion of me or your negative opinion of me. They're both the same. Neither one impacts me because right. it's his, his input I'm after. You know, well, so and, it, and it's a status. Really, yeah, we're, we're sons, we're status. And I think the other key point back to, you know, kind of first conversation is the struggle Christians have with this idea of judging sin or all that, you know, other people, we judge people more than we judge sin, is that we're going back to this mean God, punishing God and this performance based identity. Yeah. Right. We can love people who are sinners because sin just means missing the mark. I miss the mark every day. If we're icebergs and we think 60,000 thoughts a day and 95 percent of them are subconscious. And Jesus says, do not fear, don't do not worry. And Paul says, be anxious for nothing. I'm pretty sure most of us are sinning a couple thousand times a day if fear and worry would fall in the yeah. category of sin. So sons can accept, hey, my sonship status, my father's love for me is irrelevant of my perfection, my holiness, my righteousness. But the law of sowing and reaping is not going to work in my favor when I step outside of his design. And when I step yeah. outside of his protection, the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he's going to destroy. He steals, kills and destroys. So I don't, I'm not afraid of God, but I am afraid of the enemy. And, but all I have to do is stay in alignment, is stay in God's protection, find the ways that those open doors are and close them. And, yeah. and just know that if I screw up, there might be a consequence, but there's still grace. God can still redeem any, anything even the enemy does. Yeah. And I, if I repent quickly, I can undo the consequence and then, you know, get the, the blessing for, for that. So doing it God's way is always five to 10 times better than doing it our way or not doing it at all. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm for rambling sure. a little bit, but um, well, no, but it's true though. Like, I mean, and the thing is, you know, sowing and reaping is a thing, right? Like what you put right. out, you get back. Right. Yeah. But in, in, in like kind, right. You know, so if I'm putting out yeah. fear, worry, and anxiety, then situations are going to come in life to create mm -hmm. more fear inducing things to create reasons right. why I'm going to worry more to cause me to be more anxious. But we can create, you know, a heavenly crop failure is what I call it. Like if, if sure. what you sow, you're going to reap, you know, but the blood of Jesus has accomplished something. So if I come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in time of deed, not timidly, because I'm not sure God actually wants to solve my problem, you know, because I think he's mad at me when he's not, you know, right. I can just say, dad, look, I messed up. You yeah. know, I, it, it's like that no. meme that says, you know, which kind of dad do you have? Oh, no, my dad's going to kill me. Or the one that says, hey, dad, I, I messed up. I need to call my dad. Right. right, right, right. And that's the one we need to learn to get is that we don't have a, a heavenly father that says, oh, no, I messed up. My dad's going to kill me. We have a heavenly father who said, oh, no, I messed up. I better call my dad because he'll come help fix it. Right. Exactly. And and it really is that simple. I mean, the cover of my book, I just think is is perfect because in that way, we're just this little four year old that keeps bumbling around and screwing things up and like holding daddy's finger going. Like, I, you know, you, you got me, thank God, because I know I'm going to mess this up if I'm on my own. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we have both this paradox of being, you know, warriors, sons, walking in the authority of the kingdom and being these little children who are insignificant as far as compared to our father. Right. 
Yeah. And, and both are true. And it's just such a beautiful marrying of getting to be childlike with our daddy and yet recognizing we carry this authority in us that Jesus said, greater works will you do. And it's that simple. If yeah. we know how to walk in that alignment, it's designed to be that simple. Yeah. Um, so. So good. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things too, in all of this, you know, when, when we start to more and more understand our identity positionally as sons that, that like you said really well, like that doesn't change, like our actions don't change any of that. Like nothing about what I think, nothing about what I do changes the fact that I'm a son of my father in heaven. That is an immovable position. Right. And, and when I understand that's an immovable position and start to change my beliefs to understand that, it actually will have a ripple effect and start to change the things I think about, change the way my emotions function, will change those things to, to line up with that immutable truth, right? But with that, then it also means when, you know, the IHOP stuff, all of these other things going on as ministers come out and we find out that they're less than perfect or in some ways having grievous issues they're causing. Right. Um, and in some ways, the 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 sort of church system, if you will, is is in sometimes covering up and helping, you know, foment um, that that doesn't have to change where I'm at or how I'm handling things. And and to be clear with that, I'm not anti-church. I'm not, not anti the body of Christ. Um, there are problems in the system that need to get addressed, but that doesn't mean everything everywhere is bad either. There are men and women of God who love him, who would lay their life down for the people that God has entrusted in their care. And, you know, there are a lot of good men and women out there that, that, you know, are doing exactly what God's called them to. And we want to honor and value that too. But at the same time, we don't want to prop it all up at the expense of everybody that's getting hurt right. and wounded along the way either. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And I think, it, you know, it's a journey, but <clears throat> when you experience peace and when you start to get freedom and you get out of the ought to, have to, should, it's so one of the things in the addiction cycle is you act out and then you feel shame and you feel guilt and you try hard. And it's actually that shame and guilt that keep you looped in this addiction cycle. It's the self-flagellation, yeah. the beating yourself up. And when you let go when you in the sense of i'm flawed i need help i ask for help but you stop the shame and guilt you get out of the cycle and so that's true in every area we perform when we just know that we're loved all the time we receive forgiveness we forgive ourselves we we give ourselves grace we give other people grace we love others as we love ourselves yeah. so if we're always beating ourselves up we're going to beat other people up too well, and and so when we're in the judgment too, because if you think yeah. about it, if I come, you know, if I look at something, see, see it as shameful, I feel guilty. I then condemn myself. If I condemn myself, I'm condemning myself as guilty, which means I'm then under judgment. Who am I, who's judging me? I am. So if right. I place myself under judgment, then I have to receive the penalty for my judgment. And that's right. why forgiving ourselves is so powerful because when I forgive myself, I mean, God already forgave me. I just need to apply right. that. To right. forgive myself of, of the ways that I have condemned myself as guilty. Right. And then I get released from all of those things. And then I it pulls me into a totally different cycle of sowing and reaping into health and life instead of, you know, continuing that spiral downward. Well, and back to the performance based identity. If my identity is about the act, then I'm I'm worthless. I'm, you know, value, have no value. If yeah. the act itself is just a behavior and it's not a reflection of my value, yeah. then I can go, wow, I really messed up. How do I fix it? Do I need to make amends? How, do I repair this? But it doesn't change my value. And that's how we forgive ourselves. We are not, we make mistakes and we even sometimes do things out of anger or whatever that are stupid in the sense of in the moment we go, I know I shouldn't do this, but and then we regret it but it, it's still an act or a behavior of being human and being flawed it doesn't change that we're loved that he sees us all of equal value when we can get healed enough that our identity is separate from our actions then we walk differently and that's really so where sonship is is it's just yeah. i'm i'm it, it's a freedom that is in here it's a freedom in here and it's a freedom in the way pure people experience you and the way you experience other people too yeah it's so true i was uh for those who don't know i'm a registered nurse by profession so i was working with a patient recently 
And um, it was just in a, in a situation where I just had an opportunity to essentially share what you're saying right now and just kind of speak that into our lives. I forget how it came up, but, um, but this woman was talking about how she was just struggling basically with, with feeling like she had value because her value in her mind was placed on the things that she did for people. And as she was struggling with these physical issues, she was then not able to perform the ways that she wanted to perform to do things for her family and friends. And, and so I was able to share with her, look like, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper for her so she could look at it later. But what I wrote is I said, I am inherently valuable and I am worthy of love because that's the message that, you know, I didn't really have a great opportunity to bring like, you know, the name Jesus into it. But the fact is the principle and the truth is still true, regardless of whether I attach the name Jesus to it or not, that God has made her inherently valuable and that she's worthy of love. And and as we talked, she realized, yeah, I really do value myself based on what I do. My actions determine whether I do or don't have value. And, and right. the problem with that is exactly what you're saying. Then I even have to like struggle to keep people from doing those things for me. Because if people help me and do those things that I normally do for others, now they're stealing value from me. And I absolutely right. can't have that. So then you have to do more performance, which locks you into this dysfunctional system that you'll end up just burning out. Right. And, you know once you burn out because you're trying to keep everyone from stealing value from you and you start to realize I'm inherently valuable and I'm worthy of being loved, then, um, you know, your value is inherent and you stop having to fight for your value anymore. Which right. Sets you right. Agreed. Agreed. And, and it just, it, it, it changes the game, you know, but because our world is so performance reinforcement and from early on we're parented this way, school is this way. It's counterintuitive. Your merit base increases. You're not I mean, inherently valuable. You're valuable right. if you make the business money. And I mean, there's right. a function behind, you know, why sure. some of that is. And I get that. But sure. there's a difference between how a business functions and makes it work in capitalism and your inherent worth as a person. They're not the same right. thing. Right. And so having, you know, the parental figure of you love your child unconditionally, three-year-olds really don't add much value to you know, they don't mow the lawn, they don't put the dishes away, and Try so with a three year old and letting them help, <laughs> yeah. But you, uh, my friend, uh, puts all her dishes in the lower drawer so she can teach her children to put the dishes away instead of having them in the high cabinets. So the kids that's actually really dishes. clever, it's very smart, yeah. So I mean, it makes it take um, longer and it's gonna be hard on your back, but it's still really clever because it helps, them yeah. Learn. So you know, that's really more the model. I mean, God is our father. Jesus is our, our brother. I, I like to use the idea of a kingdom in the sense of he's the king. We're prince and princesses. And we do carry this responsibility to govern the kingdom. But a good king is all loving and 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 raises us up to be sovereigns, to be responsible, to take responsibility for our position. Yeah. But we're still loved. And so, you know, there's lots of analogies to try to understand this. The, the world is an opposite model, but a job is different than a relationship. And even that with these roles and pastors is God still loves Mike Bickle desperately, but he violated the contract of, a jo of his job in yeah. what he was called to do. And he should have been fired a long time ago for those violations because it impacted a lot of people negatively, but he's still lovable. He still deserves, you know, care and concern. He shouldn't be kicked to the curb. He should be ministered to and restored as a yeah. human being. Who's a he's child still inherently God. valuable and worthy of being loved as well. He's still inherently valuable and worthy of being loved. Yeah. And so we have to separate the job that he should have gotten fired from because yeah. of the criteria to do that job yeah. and him as a human being still being worthy of God's love. And, yeah, and the exactly. church is not very good at that because so much of theology is that performance is identity and value. And we have a lot of black, white thinking, like we get very yes. all or nothing with things instead of, which I mean, is its own programming issue to be honest, but, but Correct. it's, yeah. it's its own, it's its own issue where it's all this or all that. And it's like, there's lots of shades of variation and things in there where it's like, you know what, somebody, in this relationship is an it, it, it's really valuable but in this relationship that's an absolute never um yeah. you know like they should never be allowed in this position or this scenario 
Um, however, they could be an immensely valuable in this relationship. And you know what, like, so you, sometimes you have to draw some boundaries, right? You know, yeah. having boundaries to, to restrict somebody from ways that they have, you know, broken that trust or caused issues or whatever, doesn't mean that they're not valuable. doesn't mean that they're not worthy of love. It doesn't mean whatever, but it does mean that there are results to the actions. And so you have to start changing the way you interact with them in certain areas, you know, and that's, that's true of anyone. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the human factor of trust and safety and those things are absolutely true. And we get into more complex situations with, you know, narcissism or pathological liars or, you know, addiction, you can, you can love and care someone and still see them as worthy of love and not be safe to be in a relationship with them. And yeah, those aren't, right. you know, counterproductive. Those aren't oxymorons, right? There's, yeah, there's they're not counter to each other. They can be worthy of love. And you can say, I choose to love them as a choice. And I'm simultaneously going to protect myself from being wounded by them, you know, right, because right. they because they demonstrated themselves to be untrustworthy in this relationship. Co correct. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. So there's so many nuances to that. But at the end of the day, um, I believe this next season and why that some of the reasons that exposures coming on the church now is we are in a new construction period of what the church is supposed to look like yeah. and how it's supposed to be structured. And it's not going to look like the world has designed it or the political system has designed it or corporate America has designed it. Yeah. And I don't think that's the way God intended it to look. And I think he's going to have his way um, and he's doing that. But it's interesting. I started writing this book a couple years back and I sat it on a shelf for about a year and then I started taking Seneca's flower remedy M&M &M, and I pulled it back out and um, so and finished it. But I know that there was a season for it, too. And as I listened and I didn't even know Gil at the time I was writing the book. And so I got connected to Gil and a few other people. And I thought, OK, this this sonship message is coming out and people are willing to barbecue their sacred cows that they've held on to because they, they recognize this contradiction of the loving father and this old Testament God that's been, is so heavily going to, you know, rain fire down on you and destroy you. And yeah. maybe there's another explanation. So. Yeah. So good. Well, Hey, we normally would be heading right now into a deeper dive, but I don't know how to do that. So we're okay. not going to do that, but. Um, just anyone who is interested in the future and getting to the deeper dive, uh, if you go to kingdomtalksmedia.com or .org, gosh, I should know this. Uh, let me pull up the one that has the website link on it. Uh, here we go. This one, kingdomtalksmedia.com. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, that will, you'll be able to get information about how to get the deeper dive and kind of like behind the scenes stuff for future episodes. However, with that being said, um, Robin, are there any last words, any kind of things that you want to make sure that somebody absolutely does not go away um, before they hear this, either about things that you do, ways they can connect with you, yeah. um, important messages that you think really people need to hear. Yeah, I know you've put on the, the links on there to my website and I'm on Facebook yeah. and Instagram and stuff mm -hmm. too. I mean, I really, the message of reprogramming your beliefs on a subconscious level is so key and then moving towards living at a vibration of peace and joy. And, and those are the steps really towards sonship. But I do believe in 2013, the Lord woke me up and he said, when I started to write this book, he said, there's going to come a time when living at a higher vibration is life and death. And I believe we saw this with COVID and this, the world is getting sicker and we've got to understand physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. If the church is going to survive. And so the, the onslaught is, is darker. That means the light gets lighter, but things like toxins and we know the, you know what, that so many people got that's messing up so many people's health. Now there are remedies, yeah. but across the board, across the world, we are not as healthy of people as we were five or six years ago. And, and knowing how to, be a son in the midst of this world where things around us look like they're crumbling is going to really be key in these next seasons. And I believe it's the season that we're supposed to do that. We are moving into the season where God is manifesting sons. And this right. message is important. However you slice it or dice it or approach going about it and healing those wounds of the soul is a key part. You can't become a son carrying those wounds around. You just can't. Yeah. So true. 
Well, Dr. Robin, this has been so good. I really appreciate you taking uh, time with me, time with everyone else tonight. Um, I would encourage you all, um, if you haven't already, please like and share this. Um, if you have a friend or family member that you think really should hear this message, just let them know you love them and send them the link. Let them know, because the thing is, you know, in this conversation, right, we're not guilting anyone. We're not condemning anyone. We recognize everybody's got stuff, but we're also talking about how Dr. Robin and her books, her resources can help provide you a way out of the stuff and into the wholeness that God's provided. So I just really encourage you all um, share this with a friend let people know how they can step into greater freedom that God has planned for them. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Robin, so much. And I uh, wish you everyone Perfect. a good night. All right. Thank you for taking time out to listen to Kingdom Talks. You can find out more about Kingdom Talks Media and our mission to unite in faith and grow as mature sons at KingdomTalksMedia.com. Please continue to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Spreaker, Spotify, iTunes, Fringe Radio Network, and many more places. Go to our website to find links to all of our media outlets, as well as fantastic online courses and conferences, including the life-changing interactive course, Ultimate Impact. And last but not least, we ask that you consider partnering with us to fulfill the mission to get these messages to the world. To become a partner, go to the Partnership tab on our website. Thank you, and until next time, live a blessed life Keep carrying us in your heart and sharing us wherever hearts are open.